All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have Andrew Zussman presenting next. Although he's a fresh face amongst the UX community, Andrew Zussman has made a splash. A man of many hats, Andrew is a writer, speaker, and designer. After careers as an historian focused on social and intellectual history and an author of several educational books, Andrew discovered user experience design and describes his attachment to the field as an addiction. We'll get you help for that, buddy. Yeah, it's all good. Enough, fair enough. All right. Andrew has spoken at UX Scotland, Web Expo Prague, UX Con, Build Stuff, and many more. And Andrew Zussman is one of the many designers that I have had the absolute privilege of mentoring and learning from and helping me in my own career. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andrew Zussman. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think, are some people still on a break? Did they come back? All right, great. Well, um, before I start today, I want to say thank you very much to the organizers here. This is a fantastic conference, a wonderful venue, and the uh, food was delicious. So thank you very much this morning uh, to Jeff and the other speakers I saw that were very inspirational, and uh, I hope to do the same. And <clears throat> before I uh, really launch into this, I wanted to say also that I'm, I live in Israel, and it's quite a, a contrast and an interest to me to speak here today at the Museum of Polish Jews. I think uh, it's fantastic that, that on the site of great inhumanity, we're bringing so much humanity uh, to ourselves and, and, our, and our work. So let me begin. At the age of three, Rachel Barton touched her first violin. And it was apparent to everyone right away that she was a natural, a virtuoso. She was a prodigy. And as she, she grew up, she toured the world, the world stages, the best symphonies in the world, and she, she merged this, she, she filled this gap as a teenager between the, the, the heavy metal music that she loved to listen to and the, the classical music that she loved to play. And on January 16th, 1995, Rachel Barton was on her way from teaching one violin lesson to teaching another violin lesson with her $400,000, 400-year-old violin strapped across her chest. And she left the train. And the train doors closed behind her, effectively lodging her onto the train door itself. Now, in 1995, there were no sensors on train doors, and, and the panicked passengers inside saw what was, what was happening, but they saw too late. And Rachel Barton was dragged 111 meters across the track, and sucked underneath the train. Now, when the same uh, frightened onlookers jumped from the train, one helped her with a, a, a tourniquet to save her life. They noticed that, that Rachel Barton was calm. She was collected. She was able to answer questions uh, about where she was from and what her phone number was, what her parents' phone number was. And they wonder, why was she, was she so clear? Why, why, why was there so much clarity in her voice? And the answer is that, that while one leg had been severed and the other um, badly injured, she knew immediately that both her arms and her hands were intact. That her livelihood, that her love and her passion of music would go on. And today I want to ask the question, what if? I use both my arms and my hands and my fingers for my livelihood and my passion in, in UX. I would imagine that all of us here today do the same thing. So the question I want to ask is, what if, she, what if Rachel Barton hadn't been so lucky? Today I'll talk to you about what it means to type with, with one arm or one hand. I'll tell you, first of all, what universal design is and what accessibility is, where they're similar and where they're different. I'll tell you why one-handed typing matters, because the question that's, that's most often asked of me is, well, who cares? Right? Most of us today have both facilities of both of our arms and hands. Most of us work with people who have two arms and two hands. So what does it mean? Why is it important to consider those with only one arm or one hand. 
And finally, we'll look at some very interesting uh, ideas um, based on Chinese web design. We'll look at uh, the next generation of, of technology and natural user interfaces. So to begin, what is universal design? In short, universal design means a singular design that reaches the widest possible audience. Okay? The right, widest possible user base from one single design. And Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the internet, uh, sorry, invented the World Wide Web, that's his idea, he said that the power of the web is in its universality and that access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. In other words, we began with this point in web where we said, the thing that is most essential to us is that regardless of race, religion, national origin, language or ability will create a level playing field. But today we can see that this is no longer true that what we have is a playing field that's no longer level, something that works better for me because I'm American, works better for the sighted than for the blind. What we have is a playing field that's no longer level. And as designers, we can change that. I think this is my favorite uh, slide in this entire presentation because we tend to look at those who are in a wheelchair and say that they are bound by their wheelchair. But it isn't the wheelchair that holds them back, it's the stairs. And in the same way, it's not the user that makes the web inaccessible, it's the designer. It's those of us in the room today, which gives us great opportunity to create a brighter future for everyone. Now, universal design is a plan means we start with this idea that we're going to create this singular design and we're going to reach this enormous user base. It's a wide, wide, amount of, uh, a wide spectrum of different people. And the way we measure that plan, the way we say, well, how universal is my idea? How universal is this plan? Is by looking at the peripheral, by looking at the, the most unique user rather than the one who is most similar to ourselves. So if a design is accessible, is it also universal? Well, sometimes. Now, if I have, uh, let's say, hearing aids, right? Hearing aids don't give me supersonic hearing. It's something created for an accessibility need that matches a specific user. Okay? But if a design is to be universal, then it must fit everyone. I'll give you a pro tip. Every time I've asked a stakeholder, asked a client, do you want to reach the widest possible audience or are you okay leaving money on the table? They invariably answer me that they want to reach the widest possible audience. And once I have that buy-in from a client, then I'm free to create the design that will best fit everyone. And that means including accessibility. Now, I'll give you some examples of what it means, what universal design means. In the 1960s, Berkeley, California had a bit of a problem. Their curbs, street curbs, were 90 degree angles. So if you were in a wheelchair in Berkeley, California in the 1950s and early 60s, it meant that you were competing for space on the pavement with trucks and cars. Okay. So they said, look, we have to change this. Let's look at this peripheral user and see what we can develop that will, that will work for them. And what they found is a sloped curb, which I've noticed is also here in Poland and everywhere else I've visited in the world. Why? Because it's a better design for everyone. We also have this uh, grading here for, for the blind as well. We added in later. But this design enabled not only those in a wheelchair, but how about those on a bike, a baby stroller, anyone that's tried to move an apartment and had to wheel something up onto the curb, suddenly this, this design was created, created opportunities. Instead of limiting, it opened, it opened up a, a new opportunity. Here to carry on with the wheelchair example, this is from a park for, for children. I say just children, right? It's for everyone. Because whether you're a child in a wheelchair, you can wheel up there and close that and swing back and forth. 
But if you're not in a wheelchair and you just want to have fun at the park, and you're uh, any other kid, you can still jump up there and have a great time, right? It wasn't built exclusively for those in a wheelchair. It was built also for those in a wheelchair. And on the right here, most swimming pool accidents actually happen on the ladder. It was a great uh, presentation, 2012, from South by Southwest uh, called Designing for Our Future Selves. When I look at a, an image like this that has this ramp that goes down into the pool, we, we tend to think this was created for those who are disabled, but it could be for anyone, right? If you don't know how to swim and you're a child that wants to enter a swimming pool, it's a great way to get your feet wet. If you're elderly and you have difficulty entering the pool, right, your only other option is either stairs or a ladder that can both create barriers. And this removes the barrier and creates a better design, not only for the elderly and not only for children, not only for the disabled, but for me, right, for, for anyone, for all of us. You know, another example, I'm from just outside of Chicago, although I work in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, you can see, I hope you guys can see the clarity here. There's actually a, a plate of braille, clear braille, over top of the words here in the back of the cab that tell you that the cab is a legit cab. Now here you have a design that's not only for the sighted, but also for the blind and works equally well. There's a single design that works for both the sighted and the blind. And on the right, I actually checked this on my way here. Now, we're probably familiar with a walk and don't walk sign that gives us a visual indication that it's okay to cross the street. And we may also be familiar with that sound, that tick, 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 that tells us that it's okay to cross the street. But there's also actually a, a place you can feel if you're both blind and deaf. You can feel underneath the, like, I don't know how you call it, the, box, the crosswalk box. And there's a, a sensor that will actually like give you a um, haptic or textural indication that it's okay to cross the street. I checked this this morning on my way here in Poland, and you also have this underneath the box. So in some places it's above, and in some places underneath. So these are examples uh, from, from, I guess, the real world and the visual world as well has some other examples. Now, Luke Rabluski stated that he uses this idea called the, that, he, that he uses one eyeball and one finger to reach the widest possible audience. In his design called Polar, he has an application called Polar that, that tested this theory out. It's been very popular from what I understand. And it's usable by the widest possible spectrum of users, in his opinion. Right? And I think this is, this is an example of a practical application of use, universal design. We also have examples uh, like gestures, which were, have a, a much wider history than, than I'll explain here. But in 2005, Apple purchased a company called Fingerworks that looked at uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and how they could help those with carpal tunnel to better use technology. And they, they said, hey, look, these gestures are a really great way for, for those with uh, limited capability, limited dexterial, de dexterous capability, to use technology, and now we all use gestures, that what started as something that was, that was meant for the peripheral helped us to create something that was better for everyone. So anytime you talk about accessibility, anytime you talk about looking at the peripheral user, you're really talking about the human body. We talk about universal design, we're talking about not, not business to business, this isn't B2B, this isn't C to C or B to C. This is H to H, human to human. And the human body differs in its capabilities and its limitations. Now today I'll talk a lot about touch, but we're, we're, we're very familiar with, with designing for the blind. I think it's something that we're perhaps the most familiar with in these options. And perhaps the least familiar with cognition. There's a fantastic field out there for anyone that wants to to move their career forward and looking at cognition and how we process design. But today we'll talk about touch. Now, a question that I'm often asked is, do you, you have both hands, right? And I say, yeah. So how, how'd you get into this topic, right? Like, wh how is it that you, you go out across Europe and talk about universal design and those with only one arm or one hand if your arms and hands work just fine? So I'll tell you this story. I saw this online about a year and a half ago. 
And this is a design project from a, a, a woman in Taiwan. And I looked at this and I said, this is really cool. Right? An octopus tentacle? Come on. This is really, really cool stuff. And we're making these great advancements in prosthetics. And I, I don't have any background in prosthetics. I don't know what's really an advancement. But I looked at this and I thought, wow, you know, this is a really neat thing. And I scrolled down and I did something that I recommend that, uh, that none of you ever do. I read the comments on the website. And one guy had written 300, 400 words railing against this. He said, I have one arm. I don't want to go to the mall and have people stare at me. This could never work. Right? It's, it's an interesting idea. It looks nice, but it could never work for me. And I looked over this guy's work and I said, how did he type that? Right? The guy had written 400 words saying how awful this design was. I said, how did he type it? So I began doing research. I began to, to look into how users with one arm or one hand type. And I asked myself this question. If I, o if I only had one arm or one hand, how would I use a keyboard or a tablet or the keyboard on my mobile phone? And I thought, there's got to be some software. There's got to be some hardware. There's got to be some technology that I'm just not aware of. And I looked at this, this keyboard here that, that if you also have a limited range of mobility, so you're, you're maybe stroke victims are a great example of who would use that kind of keyboard. And I looked at these half keyboards, and I tried out software that mimics the half keyboard to see how comfortable it was. And I looked at concept designs for, for one-handed users. And I thought, this is great. There really is a lot of great technology out there for, for users with one hand. So let's find out what they're actually using. And I began interviewing as many one-handed users as I can find, which is actually a very challenging um, issue because users with only one hand don't always associate themselves as having one arm or one hand. They associate with whatever caused them to have only one arm or one hand. So if you had, for example, Alex Wegman here uh, on your left had bone marrow cancer, he associates with those who had bone marrow cancer, not with those who have one arm or one hand. Now, Alex is actually a drummer. He tours the world. He was most recently in China. He, he grew up with both arms and both hands, and suddenly they, they found out he had bone marrow cancer and had to amputate his arm. He continued to play after that. The guy wails on drums. And he said... You know, after this happened, my parents bought me every piece of technology that, that I asked for, anything I wanted, any, any keyboard, anything. And it didn't work so well. I also intro introduced you Tasha Books, who's a blogger and writer. She has a congenital disorder called focomelia. Actually, if you'll notice, she, she has both arms and both hands, but they don't work quite the same way uh, as mine, for example. And Tasha said that she, she grew up, uh, and actually in her high school, she got very lucky. They had a book on how to type with one hand. So in her typing class in high school, she used an alternate manual to learn how to type with one hand, which was great in high school. But when she got to college and she had to type much longer documents, she began to prefer an alternate layout to, the key, to a keyboard called the Dvorak method keyboard that puts more common letters in the home row of a keyboard. So it looks something like this. This is actually the Dvorak keyboard. So I interviewed a series of one arm or one-handed um, users, and I asked them what they used. And, and along the way, I learned a bit about the history of the QWERTY keyboard. Does anyone here know this history? Why we have the QWERTY keyboard, at least in the English, English keyboard? The QWERTY keyboard is actually created for efficiency and usability. When you have a typewriter and you press multiple keys at the same time, right? Like, you whoosh, like that. The hammer of the key, keys fly up and hit the paper. And if you do too many at once and they get jammed, and someone has to come out and fix your typewriter. So they said, look, here we got a great idea. People are typing too fast. we got to slow them down. We're going to create something that's 
perfectly efficient for our business goals and perfectly useless for anyone who's trying to type so that they'll type slower. Now, we don't have that problem anymore, right? So it stands to reason that we would change the way that we type. We would change our keyboard, but yet we don't. And what I found is that, that one-handed or one-armed users are using the same keyboard that I am. They're using a standard QWERTY keyboard. So they don't use special software. And they don't use special keyboards. Tasha Books tried to use her, her Dvorak method keyboard, which is surprisingly unavailable for Apple devices. So on her desktop, which is a PC, she uses the Dvorak method, which is in every copy of Windows. But on her iPad and on her iPhone, she goes back to using the inefficient QWERTY method. Now many people have asked me, so who cares, right? Very few people who have one arm or one hand. But in looking at this peripheral user, we can in turn create something that will work better for us all. Something that will work better for everyone. Because today, this is what the typing experience looks like for tablet and mobile. Now, we've done a wonderful job taking our mouse and inserting it into these, these flat pieces of glass. We've done a fantastic job at that, but we have done a poor job as designers at creating a typing experience that's worthwhile. Look how much screen space this takes up. Look how awkward it is to use a mobile or a tablet keyboard and how often we use them. So in solving the one-handed or one-arm typing, typing issue, we'll in turn improve typing for everyone. And that is, is, the, is the crux of universal design, creating something that works better for us all. But how do we solve this problem? Well, first, we need something that's portable. Alex Wegman had a special keyboard, but he didn't like to take it to his friends' houses to play video games. It was bulky and it was heavy and it required installing drivers. We need something that's portable. And we need something that's inexpensive. Right? Anyone want to take a guess how much a half keyboard costs? Throw out a number. Or don't. Okay, that's fine too. $700. $700 for a half keyboard. Okay, we need something that's inexpensive that will work. If we want something that will work for the widest possible audience, we can't bank on everyone being wealthy. We need something that's available. Available everywhere. And we need something that's, that's easy to use. I'll talk in a few minutes about what it means to, to type in Chinese, and you'll understand a little bit more about ease of use. How many people here are left-handed? Raise your left hand. All right. Great. Quite a few. And just in being left-handed, there are, there are issues associated with that because most designs are created for right-handed users. So if we want to create something that's better for everyone, we have to consider right-handed and left-handed users. We have to create something that looks great or no one will want to use it. We have to create something that can be easily and quickly learned so we don't have to teach some new method. Something that will be cross-platform and cross-device. Like I said, Tasha can, can type better with Dvorak, but she can't find it on every device or on every platform. We need something that's ergonomic. I care a lot about ergonomics and I really... I really recommend that you get yourself a better mouse and a better keyboard if you want to spend the next 30 or 40 years working in this industry. We need something that's multilingual. I think this is especially poignant as an American, as a native English speaker, to come and speak in Europe, where not everyone's first language is English. Surprise, surprise. That we need better typing experiences not only for English speakers, but for everyone the world over. And finally, we need something that goes beyond word processing. There are plenty of brilliant people who can write phenomenal code 
or create wonderful designs that don't look like me. I don't want to limit them. I want to open their, open their possibilities. Now, at this point, I want to tell you that I've come here today with, with this roadmap in mind. And if I had a solution, believe me, I would give it to you. But I don't have a solution. Instead, I've come with a challenge to you to take this roadmap and to create something that will work better for everyone. And anyone who's interested in working on this with me, I'd be glad for your help. Now, we do have some temporary solutions for now, right? We have speech recognition, Siri and Google Talk, Dragon Speak, and these things are improving, and they're actually a great help. They work not only, not only for me, but for those who have only one arm or one hand, right? Anyone can use Siri as long as they can speak. It's a great step in the right direction toward, toward finding a solution for this problem. The same is true with swipe for those who have Android phones. Swipe allows you to drag your finger between different letters. So if I drag my finger from the H key to the I key and release, it will show me the word hi. Okay? So actually, I think the typing experience has been, been greatly improved by Android while Apple is still well, well behind the curve. So swipe allows me not only to drag my finger between letters, but also to, to press each individual key to use speech recognition, or even to draw out the letters if I find that that's easier for me. Okay? Creating a flexibility in the design is critical toward finding a design that's more universal. Now this is a keyboard from China. I'm sorry, wait. That's the keyboard from China, right? With all of the different keys. So when I first started researching this topic, I thought, let me find out a little bit more about what the Chinese are doing because they, they must have a different way of thinking about typing. And in fact, they do. There are two different ways that Chinese uh, typing occurs. One is a very long learning process to create something that allows you to type very quickly. The other is a very quickly and simply learned process that, that takes time to actually type. Okay, so these are the two ways that the Chinese um, have overcome this, this obstacle in their, in their typing experience. And they've led to all kinds of creations like this. There are actually quite a few different interesting technologies of how to create a better typing experience for the Chinese. But I noticed something else when I looked at Chinese web design. This is Yahoo in, in China. Now, like, to our eyes in the West, this looks very complicated and... There's not a lot of white space, and it could be confusing. Actually, to the Chinese, this is a very clear design. It's very readable. There's no problem there. But what I want you to note is that this is the search engine on Yahoo in China, while this is the search engine in Yahoo in America. Now, please note that actually the search button here is the only element in... Uh, in the style guide for Yahoo that's three-dimensional, the only one that's a different color, right? It's blue. Because they want you to use the search engine here. Yahoo wants you to use that. But here, we don't see the same effect. We see that this is, this is meant to be pushed, pushed to the background. So part of, part of solving this typing problem for the Chinese meant trying to create a different information architecture to reduce or limit the burden on the user to type. And we see that again, this is actually, this is a, I know it looks nothing like it, but this is the Chinese version of Google. It's called Baidu. And Baidu had a problem that many of their users were elderly and had difficulty typing. Just in general, they had difficulty learning how to use a keyboard. So they created this. Which these are a list of like hot topics. We see it's like trending along with categorized databases of information so that without typing, with only the use of a mouse, you could still find the information you're looking for. And so many of us speak about information architecture, and there's a lot to learn from Chinese web design about how to create an information architecture that will not only engage users and create a, a, a more 
solid foundation for usability, but will also help us reduce the burden on the, user, um, the user's abilities or disabilities uh, with their hands. Hardware. Another example I'll give you from Taobao, which is uh, like eBay. Now, Taobao above the fold looks somewhat similar to eBay. They're not quite the same. It's maybe a, a little more information above the fold here. But below the fold, things get a little more interesting, right? Below the fold, I've categorized knowledge, right? If I need to buy a pair of shoes, I know I can click here. If I'm looking for men's clothes, if I'm looking for women's clothes, if I'm looking for baby clothes. I can't read Chinese, but I understand what's here. And this is eBay below the fold. It's a mess. It's like Pinterest something. If you, if you hit refresh, the same things don't occur. Because our idea in the West about what it means to browse data is shaped by the, the, the idea that we'll walk into a store and randomly see something we want to buy and purchase it. As a designer, if there's one thing I hate, it's random, random design. And this is very randomized, or this is very structured. This is closer to a universal design than this. So I told you about what's happening now with speech recognition and swipe and, and Chinese web design. But what might our future be? Well, to begin with, we began with codified and strict language and command line interfaces. We're, we're speaking to the computer in exactly the language the computer wants, wants us to speak. And we moved on to something that was a bit more freeing, that allowed us to have this in, in graphical user interface that allowed us to have a, a, a higher level conversation, to, to, to move closer toward, toward a, a human-computer interaction that would that would enable us to, to move closer to, to what we could understand as human beings. And the next step is natural user interfaces that almost disappear, that become part of our lives instead of a necessary obstacle toward, um, toward finding what we need to find or using a product the way we want to use it. Now, I said in the beginning that Luke Robluski used one eyeball and one finger but today, I want to add one more body part to this. I want to add one nipple. <laughs> we love to talk about things that are simple and intuitive. We need to understand that the only intuitive interface is a nipple, and after that, it's all learned. We love to see these videos of two-year-olds flipping through an iPad that are unable to change the page on a magazine, and we say, look how intuitive the iPad is. But something that's intuitive is only something that's quickly learned. It's quickly learned. So keep that in mind as we, as we look at these natural user interfaces. It doesn't take much to learn that once you stand up, the toilet flushes, or that once you approach the door, the door opens. These are actions that we expect as users. And as, and as time goes on and we look at more and more of these, like Oculus Rift and the guys I spoke to last night who are working with, with Kinect, the, the Xbox Kinect that can sense that there's a user there, there's a person there. We see a lot of designs like this and what we don't see are keyboards. I'm going to show you back my, my original list. So these are the things that we need as a roadmap toward creating a typing experience that will work better for everyone. And as I noted, I came today with this challenge. I want you to take this information and see what you can do to create a better typing experience if you're so inclined, or to consider universal design, to consider how wide your audience might be, to look at the peripheral user and use that person to help you create a better design for everyone. I hope, you, I hope you understand a bit more about the difference between universal design and accessibility. I hope you understand what it means to, to create something that works better for everyone. I began today and I told you that Rachel Barton was lucky. But I also think that 
Alex Wegman and Tasha Books are lucky as well because they have those of us here today to design and to create a better world for them as well. Thank you very much.